Watching Harmony and Diversity. I was speaking again with Jonathan Karen Black. He's a rabbi at the Leo Beck Centre in East Q. Thanks for coming back. Nice to be here again, Norm. Now, we started last time talking about what it means to be progressive. Uh, it, something that occurs is with being progressive, of course, there's the orthodox at the other side of that. What's the interface between those two, the sizes of the communities and the interfaces between them? So um, there's all sorts of diversity within the Jewish community. There's mm. lots of different parts of the orthodox community. Um, mm. There's orthodox Jews who look like you and me and don't cover their heads mm. in in their work, in the day-to-day -day life. There's Orthodox Jews who cover their heads all the time. And there's ultra-Orthodox Jews who are the ones that people typically see around Caulfield and places like mm -hmm. that uh, with the black hats and the yes. fur and the side locks. Um, small part of the community, but the visible part of the community. Yeah. And then there's progressive Jews who, uh, who look like you and me. Um, mm. uh, frankly, you can't tell. Uh, most progressive Jews don't wear covering their heads. Mm. I, I have mine here. Mm. Um, always have one in my pocket yes. oh, for that um, because we put them on for formal prayer. So yeah. when I'm in the synagogue, I'll put my head covering on, but I don't wear it all the time. Yes. Um, if I say a blessing, I think God will hear it even if I don't cover my head. Um, you know, I mean, if I was a woman, God would hear it. So, um, <laughs> and they don't. Cover traditionally cover the heads till they're married so no. you know so um one of the differences between orthodox and progressive is that orthodox puts more emphasis i think on ritual yes um mm -hmm. and progressive tends to say the ritual is great um if it's meaningful if it's uplifting and um touches the heart but the important thing is the behavior is your ethics mm -hmm. um and being a good human being and trying to achieve your potential um, in doing God's work in making the world better, in making mm -hmm. it a more caring, compassionate place, looking mm -hmm. after the future, looking after the world, the planet, the environment, um, uh, understanding people of other views to your own. You know, so interfaith has always been uh, up there on yes. the list for progressive Jews. Mm -hmm. um, the Orthodox community is involved with interfaith now, but it's come to it more lately. More lately, um, yeah. And in terms mm -hmm. of numbers, it's an interesting question, the numbers question. Um, you don't want to play the numbers game if you're not going to win, as it were. <laughs> and um, the truth is that in Australia, the progressive mm. community is smaller than the Orthodox community oh. uh, in terms of numbers of synagogues and synagogue membership. The same in Britain and the same in South Africa, actually. Um, but uh, I, I would suggest to you that most members of Orthodox synagogues are not actually Orthodox. Mm. Um, if they go to synagogue, they may well drive rather than walk, which is mm. one of those things that Orthodox mm. are not supposed to do and progressives don't have a problem with. Um, or they may eat out without worrying about what they're eating. So they're not really Orthodox, they're members of Orthodox synagogues. Yes. Um, if you wanted to see the breakdown between numbers wise, Orthodox and progressive, you should look at America. Yeah. So for complicated historical reasons. In America, Jews belong to the synagogues they feel comfortable with. Yeah. And there, about 10% of the community is Orthodox, and the rest of the community is progressive, uh, mm. progressive or conservative, is you know, one, mm. of, one of the different parts which is not Orthodox. Mm. And, and just to recap on the difference, the key difference, I nearly said fundamental, we have to be careful with that yeah. word these days. <laughs> right. But the key difference is that Orthodoxy yeah. believes that God gave Torah at Mount Sinai um, uh, around 4,000, 3,500 years ago, and it's true. Mm. Whereas progressives believe that Torah was written by humans trying to understand what does God want of us? Yeah. What does, how mm. should we behave? Mm. You know? mm. So that's, a, that's the key difference between orthodox and progressive. You're right. And uh, that, the, the progressive element of that, this uh, uh, 
redefinition of what, what, how Torah arose. Uh, has there any reflection of that across into other religions, like there being a, a progressive Christianity or progressive Islam? Is there, are there movements in that way? Well, there are definitely uh, progressives within Christianity and progressives mm. within Islam. Um, mm. Frankly, the Muslim community is very complicated and I'm not really qualified to speak on it and mm. I, I would be cautious, but I, I wish I heard more progressive voices from the mm. Muslim community, especially when we see what's happening with Islamic State. And I know that my Muslim friends are not like that mm. um, and they want to live here in Australia in peace and harmony and understanding and be free to be Muslims and be free, allow other people to, to, to observe uh, religion or non-religious non mm. in the way that they choose to. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wish they would speak up more about the terrible atrocities that we're seeing in the name of Islam. And it's not Islam, mm -hmm. the, not Islam in, the, in all of the experience of interfaith that I've been doing for 30 years. Um, I've never heard Islam described in the way that the Islamic State is, is perpetrating no. it. Um, uh, so basically... I think I'm very lucky that I'm part of a progressive movement. I trained as a progressive rabbi. I grew up in a progressive family. Mm -hmm. um, I went to a training college, Leo Beck College in London, where they train progressive rabbis. Yeah. And I work in a congregation where progressive Jews pay to be part of the congregation of progressive Jews and have employed a progressive rabbi. So, yes. you know, yeah. and what I realized lately is that progressive Christians and some of my friends are progressive Christian ministers, they have a tough time balancing mm. the more progressive and the more traditional parts of their community and, and keeping their jobs, frankly. Um, so I realized that we're lucky to have a progressive Jewish movement and, um, yes, and the, the simple answer is no, there isn't a progressive Christianity. Although I'm told that Episcopalianism in America is the closest you get. Um, yes, but uh, but there's no mm. progressive Muslim movement yet, no. and I, I, it would be nice to think there would be. It would be, particularly when, when, as you'd be very familiar with, those three religions are referred to as religions of the book because though the book has some variations, it's basically the same basic book. And, and so each people are, people are reading it and taking different things from it. And I, I think you're... Uh, the, the Torah and the Orthodox perspective and, and the progressive perspective is a wonderful illustration as to how it could look yeah, in, I don't, in the future. I, I must take issue with you before we finish the segment. It's mm. not the same book. I mean, the, mm. the Christians have the mm. Old Testament, which is nearly the same as the Hebrew Bible. Mm. The Muslim Quran is, is, has some of the same stories. It's not the same book. No, I think you're right, but it's the same time. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back. You're watching Harmony and Diversity, and we're speaking with Jonathan Karen Black. He's a rabbi at the Leo Beck Center in East Q. Now, thanks for that description of the, of the potential differences or actual differences uh, between progressive and orthodox uh, Judaism. Uh, are there any sort of other elements of it which, are, which demonstrate that difference? Well, there's lots of differences really, but I'll mm. give you a couple of examples. One of them is a minor one, mm. um, but an obvious one, um, that um, within the Orthodox community, they have an extra day of their festivals mm. because for 2000 years living outside of the land of Israel, they have decided that you can't be sure you're observing the right day because you might not know when there was a new moon. Mm. And despite the fact that we've been able to calculate it for well over 2000 years, mm. um, they still observe an extra day of festival. So at, this is the Passover festival. Of course, this year it coincides as it often does with Easter. Mm. And it, Torah tells us it's a week long festival, seven days, mm. but the Orthodox are observing for eight days. Mm. In fact, we have a on the 11th, we have a spirituality seminar. As far as we're concerned, it's the day after Passover. But as far as the Orthodox are concerned, it is the last day of Passover. Passover right, so, yes. you know, yeah. so we, we have the matzahs, yeah. the unleavened bread to eat. 
yes. um, to remind us of the exodus from Egypt and um, we relive the exodus and the pain of slavery because the message of Passover is about freedom, the importance of freedom for all people. So the message right. is the same, but the practice is a little bit different. Mm. Um, but that's, that's sort of, that's less significant. And more significant is that we put emphasis on ritual. No, mm. that's not right. We put less emphasis on ritual and we put emphasis on the ethical behavior yeah. and achieving our potential as human beings. And the Orthodox put more emphasis on the ritual. So for example, they would say you shouldn't drive on the Sabbath or mm. use money on the Sabbath. And we would say that's the way we get around today. The Torah doesn't mm. say anything about driving cars from 3000 mm. years ago, surprisingly. Um, <laughs> it's and it's true. therefore an interpretation that the Orthodox have come up with that you shouldn't drive. And as far as we're concerned, that's how we get about. And we would like mm. people to come to the synagogue and be part of a community and, and pray and say, celebrate together and um, so we're not fussed about driving and um, actually we're not that fussed about using money on the Sabbath as long as it's for appropriate things. So mm. for example I won't fill up the car with petrol, I'd fill mm. it up before to before. prepare for yeah. Shabbat like mm. having the nice meal made ready and the house clean and so on. It's part of preparing for Shabbat each right. week. Mm. Um, but I'm not worried if we go out as a family to the cinema. We went to the National Theatre last Saturday um, mm. to, you know, it's something nice to do, enjoyable to do together. And mm. um, of course, it's not appropriate for Orthodox people. Now, what I need to say is I'm not criticizing anybody. No, you know, people no. choose how they want to bring God into of their course. lives, yeah. and that's entirely up to them. But for me and my congregation, um, we uh, are not worried about the ritual in the same way. Most of us are not so worried about the ritual as about the effect, you know, of enjoying the Sabbath and enjoying it with your friends and family and, uh, yeah. Well, so j just this progressiveness in, say, the environmental or ecological movement, uh, would the progressive people be more likely to adapt? That You yourself are, are heavily involved in, in that. Is that because you're progressive or because you're something else? Just interested. Look, Norman, that's a very interesting question. Mm. The truth is that the Jewish tradition has been involved and aware and engaged with the environment since the very beginning. I mean, mm. I would interpret the Genesis story as what are we doing here as human beings? God has put us here to take care of the earth. God mm. has put us here to take care of his God's creation. Um, so, and in fact, the rabbis would say the same from more than a thousand years ago. There's a very nice story. I might have told it last week, actually, but uh, that that Adam is shown round the Garden of Eden and told, mm. take care of creation, because if you destroy it, there won't be anybody else to take care of it after you. So it's it's really a very powerful story, Amazing, yeah. worth repeating mm. a second time, um, mm. which I think I did. But, um, you know, so you can't say that it's only progressive Judaism that has become aware of things like the environment. What I would say is that orthodoxy has got a little bit stuck in the ritual and uh, I would see it as a bit closed mm -hmm. um, in the past, in the past hundred years or so, and that progressive Judaism feels it's very important to look after things like the environment and do interfaith work. And the Orthodox world is coming there later, slower. Right. So I'd say that progressive right. Judaism is now moving <coughs> Judaism forward. But I would also say, I don't want to give the impression that progressive Judaism is something new. Mm. Progressive Judaism has only existed for 200 years as a body, as a movement. Um, mm. But the truth is that Judaism has always moved forward and progressed and developed in yeah. line with the challenges of the times until it's got stagnated and progressive Judaism has come around to move it forward, to keep responding, to mm. have this progressive revelation, a contemporary understanding of what God wants of us. I think you, in an earlier conversation, you mentioned something about a slow revolution. Uh, That's an example. There's so. a wonderful description of Judaism. I love it. And mm. I can't find out where it comes from, but it's been described as a slow revolution. And mm. I think, you know, revolutions are to change the world. Mm. And Judaism is about changing the world. The problem with revolutions is like the Russian Revolution. Obviously, many people lose their lives. They can be very bloody. And at the end of the day, you have... Um, a change in the order, but you don't necessarily have a perfect solution. And right. um, 
And I believe that Judaism is a slow revolution. It's taken 4,000 years, but we're still working on it and we're still trying to perfect the world. That's our task. Mm. And, that, and that's a God-centered revolution very much, isn't it? It's, it's... Um, yes, in that we believe that that's our task to mm. work as God's tools in the world to make the world better. Yes. But mm. I have to say that there are plenty of atheist Jews um, mm. who feel the peoplehood or connectedness or mm. the sense of history and this drive to make a world better without believing in God in a traditional sense. Mm. Um, so I think it's important to say that. You, know, you asked about the house. So we've got a minute to talk about Yes, that? yes, we do. So, yeah. yes, I built an environmental house because I actually believe uh, so I go to synagogue and I lead the prayers. Uh, and as I said last week, I, I did. Uh, I was the leader of the editorial team for our new prayer book. But there's no point in saying the prayers if you don't do something about it. So I very much believe yeah. in putting prayers into practice. And you, in, as well as putting prayers into practice, you need to put the respect for time into practice. Yeah, sure. We'll be back in a moment. <laughs> Welcome back. You're watching Harmony University. We're speaking with Jonathan Karen Black. He's a rabbi with the Leo Beck Center in East Kew. And I interrupted you before when we were talking about the eco house. Uh, that's fine. What I was suggesting was that um, prayers are all very well, but they're really a mirror to say, are we doing what we should be doing? Are we doing what God wants us to do? Mm. Uh, and it's no good just sitting there and saying the prayers. You've got to put mm. prayer into practice. Yeah. And I, I realize that a lot of people do things like recycling in terms of environment and looking after the world. People recycle, um, but it's not enough. The world is in a dire state and we've mm. got to do an awful lot more if we're going to save the world for our children and grandchildren. Sadly, uh, I find it a very worrying situation. And I've been very lucky that I have been able to build two houses. Um, mm. Uh, the first was in Britain, and it was an underground house uh, yeah. where we dug a hole and put the house in, in the hole, in the hole. Mm. and uh, put a garden on the roof, and um, wonderful environment, right. very mm. temperature stable, very mm. energy efficient, um, very quiet, um, and very light and bright. Had open patios and skylights, and you know, oh, right. surprises yes. people, not dark mm. at all. But mm. uh, and I was able to say, I'm sorry, I can't come out on Sunday afternoon. I've got to mow the roof, <laughs> you know. But um, but in, in in Melbourne here in 2006, we built a house which looked much more conventional, mm. just a, a one of a dozen houses that were being built. Um, uh, but the only one that was environmentally specified, a mm. uh, seven star house, and. Um, and it basically, we were able to measure it against the others over time and mm. uh, similar size and sort of family size and so on. You can't tell how much water people are using, mm -hmm. how many baths they're having. But on average, yeah. our usage of energy was one quarter of the other houses. And our usage of water was one tenth Good. You know, of, of fresh mains water as opposed to rainwater. And we collected all the rainwater and we used that in the house. But um, fresh mains water, one tenth of the other houses. So it's, really making a difference. That, that's, that's very impressive. And you, your um, uh, intentional eco-communities, would no. that be one that sort of engaged with those types Well, so it follows on from that is that we did that and one is not going to make the difference. Funnily enough, we got a lot of publicity for the underground house because it's mm. unusual and people mm. can't imagine what it's like. We mm. had 50 appearances in radio, television programs, um, uh, magazines, newspapers, uh, but virtually nothing for the house here, even though it actually was more efficient and much more water efficient because it looks like an ordinary house. And maybe because environmental houses aren't so radical anymore. Um, so... I've moved on to say, actually something else came together. As a rabbi, you see lots of difficult situations and people who can't quite cope or can't get a job or who, you know, relationships break down. And I, I see society is not really providing for a lot of people anymore. It, we have very high expectations. Um, it's expensive, medical yeah. insurance. Um, and I've come to the conclusion that we ought to be looking at other alternatives. So 
I have looked at uh, intentional eco communities, and that, that's what I'm researching at the moment for part mm -hmm. of an MA that I'm doing actually. But right. I would love to set up an eco community near Melbourne. Mm -hmm. um, and, and and that eco community, what would be a rough outline of what that might that might look like? It, it, it's a, presumably a closed village type. Yes, it really, in a sense, it's a return to the village. You know, the mm. cities have been, you've still got this huge flow of people coming into the cities. Melbourne's projected to be the biggest city in Australia, you know, within a few years. And um, it's not surprising that people want to live in a city because all all the provisions, but cities have been described as millions of people living together in loneliness. And um, I think it's very sad. You know, there's something about a village community where you actually know your neighbours, talk to them, look, uh, help each other. You mm. know, somebody's good at something, somebody's got spare oranges on their tree. Um, you actually share, you actually care. You have time to talk to people and get to know them. Yes. And that's what I'm interested in is uh, sort of creating a village community, a bit like a kibbutz or a moshav, where it would be off-grid, you, houses would be environmental, um, you'd collect your own water, um, uh, but solar panels, you know, so it would be ecologically a very low footprint on the earth, but it would be a community looking after each other. Um, bakery, common interest, you might have some mm -hmm. um, allotments, but you'd also have some common ground, um, common spaces. So would that, that clearly wouldn't be a, a religiously based thing, that'd be just an economic and sociologically based. Oh, well, it's interesting yeah. you say that because actually a lot of the ones I'm researching are um, religiously based. Uh, a lot of them are Buddhist retreats and so on. But, okay. um, but right. I would right. be thinking they wouldn't be exclusively religious, well, certainly wouldn't be one religion, mm -hmm. um, and, and it would be open to everybody to come along to. But I would love to have a Jewish sort of ethos. Um, yeah. So, for example, if it's near Melbourne, we would invite people to come and share the Sabbath and have a day of rest together, um, you right. know, as a way out of town and of experiencing it and um, lighting the Sabbath candles together. The whole community, whether you're Jewish or not, um, mm. that, that's my vision at the moment. But I'm, but I'm working on this MA will take several years to do, so the yeah. idea will no doubt carry on developing. Mm. And I'd love to come and tell you more about it. Well, you'll certainly be invited to do that, and I hope you can. It, 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 and you've got some precedent in this, as we were talking earlier, with the kibbutz, although they're changing, you, you mentioned, they're changing in their Yeah, their well, the kibbutz, kibbutz is not a kibbutz. I mean, I say kibbutz just for, so people have some idea of what we're talking mm. about, but actually mm. the kibbutz was everything was collectively owned, and that's mm. gone out of fashion. People want their own space, yeah. but they want to be part of a community, and the, the, the model uh -huh. actually is called a moshav, yeah. which means a settlement. Um, where you own your own house, you've got your own car, you've got your own socks. You don't have to share <laughs> underwear, <laughs> but you also have some shared facilities and you've yeah. got a shared sense of purpose as a yeah. village. Right, yes, that's, yes I'm, glad, I'm glad you had your own socks. But <laughs> so, so, say movements like, like ARC, yes. um, do they have any influence on this? And, and we're actually running out of time when I look at our time are there, so perhaps we might not go there. Mm. I think the answer is yeah. yes. Yeah, yes, it, it's, so it's a collective awareness. Jonathan, thank you so much for coming to talk about the, this very interesting topic. And, and you did lightly allude before to coming back to pick it up and uh, talk more about this and sundry other elements as well. Sure. Uh, would you be happy to do that? Very happy. No. Yeah. Thank, Thank you for giving the opportunity to talk about it. That's uh, that's uh, My pleasure. congregation have heard a lot about it, but I'd like to yeah. have the wider audience. So appreciate telling you. Our pleasure. You've been watching Harmony and Diversity. We'll be back next week. Bye for now. Shanti Allahu <laughs>